Well, good morning, everybody, and we welcome all of you in the room and all of you on Facebook Live, and uh, just invite you on Facebook Live, if you don't mind, maybe checking in with us and letting us know that you're out there and uh, listening and worshiping with us, and uh, some of you like to amen and and, uh, say hello, so just so we know who you are out there, uh, uh, let us know you're there. Let's all stand together in the room here. We're going to enter into a time of worship and time to turn our minds attention and our hearts affection towards our savior jesus amen Amen. Thank you, Lord. The great and mighty and awesome God we serve. Amen. I 
Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I just love that song. Thank you, Jesus, that, Lord, you turn seas into highways and graves into gardens. Thank you, God.
Jesus. Praise the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and just give him praise this morning for uh, his holiness. When you think about that song and the opportunity we have just to humble ourselves before the Lord, it's a great privilege. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit, the indwelling presence that walks with us every day. And Lord, as we come together today, let us just rejoice in who you are and the opportunity to be together as the body of Christ, worshiping you and falling down in the presence of God before a mighty God. We thank you for your purity, your holiness, your power, your love, and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God. It's good to see you all here today. Well, if you guys want to take a minute and greet one another, and we will dismiss just the elementary today. So elementary, go on back to your class. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome today. Welcome, everyone that's here. Welcome to our viewers on Facebook Live. We're so glad to have you. If you're a first-time visitor with us today, please stop by the booth on your way out. Uh, we'd like to collect some information from you, and we have a small gift for you. So uh, please stop by and uh, let us know that you've been here. Uh, men's uh, Bible study group on Monday nights is going to take a break until March 31st, but we do still have the Tuesday, Thursday morning Zoom Bible study that we're doing from 6.30 to 7.30. If uh, we're going through the book of Matthew, and if you've never uh, joined and would like to join, get a hold of Ron Bond, and he will get you connected to the Zoom room. Love that, Zoom room. <laughs> we're continuing the Blessed Life video series on Wednesday night. Wow, this is just amazing. Even if you have not been here, Please plan to attend. It's from 6.30. We're done by 7.30, quarter to 8. It's a great video series about the blessed slide by Dr. Robert Morris, and you will be blessed if you attend. So uh, please uh, uh, try to attend. And child care provided. Can anybody say date night? Yeah. <laughs> All right. And then a couple of other things. Uh, we still are in need of a few... Um, Preschool monthly teachers, once a month is all I think that they're asking you to serve if you can. So um, if it's been on your heart to find a place to serve and you're good with children's and little ones, uh, please see Nadia or Darla. Lastly, next Sunday, spring forward. We lose an hour of sleep, right? Aww. But it's going to be daylight longer in the evening, so... Uh, next Sunday, don't forget to adjust your clocks. Then we do have daylight saving times, and we spring forward one hour. Amen? Thank you, Mike. <laughs> I wish they'd just quit messing with the clocks. You know, I wish they'd just throw that out for a vote, let everybody decide whether they want to be messed with. But about the time you get in a good sleep-wake cycle, you know, then they do that, and it takes me several weeks to get all recovered from that. So, well, it's good to see everyone and uh, all the Facebook family. Good to see you today, too. Or, we don't actually see you, but uh, <laughs> you can see us, so thanks for tuning in. I'm going to try to uh, finish the book of Esther today. It's been a, an interesting study. I've really enjoyed it. I hope you have, too. Uh, you know, just there's so many parallels in the book of Esther to what's going on today, and I'm going to be kind of highlighting some of those a little bit again today. But uh, uh, some theologians believe that Esther is just an allegory, it's a legend, that it didn't really happen. Um, more of a literalist, unless the Bible is very clearly symbolic. I believe it, I take it literally, I believe it really did happen. There's a lot of these characters that can be found in history. So we know that uh, Xerxes and, and the different aspects of the Persian Empire are accurate. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. But, but even taking it literally, there's an allegorical comparison to several periods throughout history. If you look down through history at different uh, revolutions and, uh, and major 
uh, societal changes. Boy, I tell you, a, a lot of these things that are going on in the book of Esther repeat themselves uh, down through history. They repeated themselves during the, obviously during the Bolshevik Revolution. There's cultural cleansing and all of that uh, conformity. W- what you see in, in, in this story, and we're going to look at that again in a minute, is you see the uh, the tendency for what we would consider to be a tyrannical government to demand conformity. And that's one of the things that really distinguishes a tyrannical government. It's, it's oppressive. Uh, they set a, a tone, a national tone, a national philosophy, uh, a national mindset. Uh, you know, you can call it politically correct speech. You can call it whatever you want to call it. Uh, but and then they they work the society so that you uh, are oppressed if you don't go along with that. And in some cases, like we see here in the book of Esther, it gets more serious even than just general oppression. Well, let's pray, and then we're going to go into Esther again today. So if you have your Bible or electronic device, <clears throat> go ahead and turn to the book of Esther. It's an Old Testament book after Nehemiah. Let's pray. Father, as we turn to the Scripture this morning. I pray that you will once again highlight the things that you want us to, uh, to see and uh, let the things that are not important not be uh, dealt with. But Father, we pray in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Get this thing right here. All right. So we're looking today at uh, just a little bit of review. Last week I talked about uh, how Haman, you know, what is the source of Haman's rage? Haman's rage was not what you would call a normal response to an irritating situation. It was a little over the top, you know, because Mordecai wouldn't bow to Haman. Haman realized that Mordecai was a Jew, and the reason he wouldn't bow and give homage to Haman was because of his Jewishness. And then Haman set out to not only punish Mordecai, who was the direct defender of the, of the situation, but he wanted to wipe out the whole Jewish nation within the empire of Persia. And that's where, that's where you see an over-the-top response. And if you're like me, as you read history and you study biblical history, you, you ask yourself, why is there such a deep hatred and an abnormal response to a situation like that. Last week, we looked at the history of Haman. He was out of the tribe of Amalek. We know that Amalek and Israel had a long-standing hatred for one another, going all the way back to, really going all the way back to Ishmael and Isaac, and then the next generation was uh, Jacob and Esau. Uh, Amalek was the son of Esau, a direct descendancy of the tribe of Esau. And unfortunately, like we talked about last week, if you're not uh, among the direct chosen line that God chose to bring the covenant of Israel down through, everybody else seemed to turn against that. Uh, even though, and I, wonder, I don't know if I made this clear last week, uh, there was a blessing for Ishmael very clearly in Scripture. God promised to bless him. There was a blessing for Esau. God promised to bless him. It wasn't like a a, a God just casting off a whole uh, tribe or descendancy of people. It's just that they weren't the ones who were going to be the caretakers of the uh, revelation of the Abrahamic covenant. It was important to God uh, that there be a very clear, direct channel and a very close observance and caretaking, so to speak, pastoring of the Abrahamic covenant, because it was the covenant through which Jesus was going to eventually come. So it was important, extremely important, that that uh, descendancy, that that promised seed of the Abrahamic covenant be protected down through history. And God took the necessary steps in his plan to protect that revelation that in Hebrews even talks about it, how the Jewish people were were caretakers of the oracles of God, the very uh, spoken and ultimately written oracles of God that we now have, as we know as our Old Testament, was protected down through history. So it was not 
uh, polluted with all sorts of pagan influences. And that was important to God. It's important to us. It was important to the Jewish people. And because of that, people, tribes, and nations around them that were not in that direct chain became jealous, they became envious, and they developed an extreme hatred for the Jewish people. You could actually do a study of anti-Semitism just all the way down through all current history, uh, recent history, and it's amazing how, uh, how many times the Jewish people have been persecuted as a nation, as a people group. Uh, all the way down through history, the, one of the most recent horrible examples, as you know, is Adolf Hitler in the 1930s and 40s. I mean, he just set out to destroy every single Jewish family that he could find Uh, not only in Germany, but all through Poland, all through Europe, every place that the Nazis had influence. And so as we see Esther here, we see a situation where you have a pagan king, the Persian Empire, a pagan empire that was inhabited by, we don't really know how many Jews. There was probably several million Jews that were scattered across the Persian Empire Many of them had already gone back to Judah and started the process of rebuilding the temple under Ezra and Nehemiah. And so we know that a, that a good number had gone back to Judah, but that was still within the Persian Empire at this time. And so what we see is we see that uh, the issue that arose in chapter 3, just for a little bit more review here, in chapter 3 we see that Haman uh, came to the king and he said, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all other people, and they do not observe the king's laws. So it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. Now this is Haman speaking to the king. You all remember Haman was elevated to be the chief prince in the kingdom next, in other words, second in command to King Azuerus. And so he was, he was the king's right-hand man, main counselor, uh, main uh, a- uh, administrator in the kingdom. And so he had the king's ear. He could come into the king's presence on a regular basis. And so what we see here is that Haman's anger and bitterness, which was generational, down through hundreds and hundreds of years, is now in a position to be influential to attempt to destroy the whole Jewish race. And that's what he's suggesting. Notice what the offense is in Haman's eyes. He says, these people live by different laws, and they do not keep the laws of the king, and it's not in your best interest to let them remain. Now think about that for a minute. Uh, I, I, I look at that as, and very simply, very quickly compare a lot of the things that you hear today. If you're listening to the right news channels today, uh, you hear all kinds of comments made by our governmental officials about reprogramming, about uh, limiting, about cleansing, about censoring, about uh, creating new laws that would uh, make certain speech that, that are, that's very common to us, just conversation, uh, illegal. It's called hate speech laws. All of those type of things, uh, you know, are being talked about in certain of the circles. Now, you won't hear that on the regular news media because they, they don't report things like that. But it's very prevalent and it's increasing. We've already seen um, many, many ministries and many uh, uh, news commentators bumped off of uh, Facebook and off of Twitter and other platform accounts, uh, social media platforms. And, and that's happening just this week. Dr. Seuss' books got outlawed. Did you know that? I mean, I, don't, I, I didn't read Dr. Seuss as a kid, but, you know, they're, they're now deemed to be inappropriate and harmful to children. Did any of you grow up reading Dr. Seuss books? Yeah, most, most of us did. They've been around for, what, 80, 70, 80 years or more. And so now that's been determined by a certain group of people in power that that is not appropriate. So Uh, where is it going to stop? And see, that's exactly what Haman is saying to the king. He's saying these people live by a different law 
than the regular Persians do. What's that mean? It means they live by the laws of God. And as long as the laws of God are not directly violated for them, they keep the laws of the land too. Just like us as Christians today, we are encouraged scripturally to honor the king and abide by the laws, but if the laws of the kingdom, if the laws of the nation are a direct violation of the word of God, then we have to, we have to opt to follow God's word. I'm not going to violate God's word to keep the laws of the land. If the laws of the land become that wicked, which they are becoming, then I have to draw the line. I have to set boundaries. And see, that's what irritated Haman here. He, saw, he basically told the king, king, it's not in your best interest to let these Jewish people have that much freedom to exercise their laws over the laws of the kingdom. So the solution then becomes, and we see that in uh, verse 9, if it's pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they all be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry out the king's business. He was going to get the spoil from the Jewish families that were being killed, their, their wealth, and give it to the kingdom and put it into the king's treasury. So he's basically saying, let, let it be decreed that, that these people be destroyed because they're not a blessing. They're not a, a healthy part of your kingdom. And, of course, the king, not really knowing much about the Jews, even though uh, they were in his kingdom. And you might think, well, that's kind of strange. Well, there was 127 provinces that were a part of the Persian Empire at this point. A lot of different people, a lot of different nationalities, probably a lot of different religious groups. Uh, the Persian Empire went all the way over to India and all the way down to Ethiopia in North Africa. So you can imagine the diversity that was in the kingdom. So it's not, it's not out of the question to think that the king was not all that up on every different segment of his population. So he, he didn't know. He probably didn't even know how many Jews there were. And it's also interesting to see how Uh, God, as we talked about two weeks ago, strategically placed Esther right smack in the middle of the palace as the queen right there with the king. And she was a Jewess. She was a young Jewish lady. And so we see how God's strategic plan is amazing. In the midst of this, Haman wants to cleanse the kingdom of this, what he sees as opposition, and his solution is, let's kill all the Jews. And God's answer is amazing, because God, God had this plan. You know, the thing about God is he, he knew this was coming before he ever created the world. All of this is, and if you do look at Esther as an allegory, I want you to remember this. Don't necessarily see the king in the same allegorical position as God the Father, because the king was not all that up on what was going on, and we know that God is. Amen? So you can look at some of the other. Haman is obviously a type of the Antichrist. Esther is a kind of a type of the Holy Spirit interceding right next to the king. Uh, There are some connections you can draw here uh, in an allegorical sense, but but the king really doesn't fit the allegory in in the sense of of God the Father, because God, nothing catches God by surprise. Nothing. Every single thing that happens on this earth at any time in history, all the way through the end of the age, God knows exactly what's going to happen, and He prepares us, He prepares His people for it if we will follow His leading. Amen? So that's why it's so important, the world we live in right now, it's so important to be in the Word of God and to have your ear tuned to the Holy Spirit, because there's a lot of things that are changing rapidly. There's a lot of things we're going to be dealing with that we've never had to deal with before, and we need to know what God's will, God's plan, and God's purpose. He's already got people strategically placed, I believe, in positions Very similar to what we see in the book of Esther. So let's look at God's answer. God's answer you start to see coming forth in uh, chapter 4 in verse 16. Mordecai goes to Esther. And uh, this whole thing, once the word got out that the Jews were going to be killed, uh, Mordecai found out about it first because he was actually 
uh, one of the administrators and scribes within the government. So he had access to some of the inside information as well. He went out in the streets and started fasting and, and wearing sackcloth and ashes. He was just devastated initially uh, and went to a place of humility. Uh, the Bible doesn't say prayer, but we assume that when you're fasting and ashes and sackcloth, you're also crying out to God. And so Mordecai started this, and Esther in the palace knew that something was wrong with Mordecai, so she called Mordecai in and said, what, what, what's wrong? You know, let me give you a, some new clothing so you're not a spectacle out there in the middle of the streets. <laughs> she was kind of initially embarrassed because of, of what Mordecai was doing. And he explained to her what the deal was. He said, look, this is what's happening. And in uh, chapter uh, 4, it says, for if you remain silent, this is Mordecai speaking to Esther, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place and you and your father's house uh, may very well perish. And who knows? This is a classic line out of the book of Esther. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Now, that, that's, that's a, that's a underline that in your Bible. If you're on an electronic device, you could probably highlight it with color. Uh, it's, it's a powerful phrase in that passage of Scripture. Who knows that God hasn't positioned you in the place of royalty for this specific time. Now, I, I think about that all the time. I think, okay, Lord, why am I on earth at this specific time? What is left for me to do? What is the position I have? You know, and I don't consider myself having a high position at all. But being a pastor, what, what am I supposed to be doing at this time? Uh, what what do you, maybe you're in a position, maybe you're working within a company or, a, or an office and you're surrounded by a certain number of people. Be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit may be saying to you about why you're in that place at this time. There may be some tremendous opportunities that God has planned for you to be a part of and to respond to and possibly be a witness to uh, for him in, in this place. And, and, and that's what we see here with Esther, the, the strategic positioning. And then Esther, of course, then once she found out what was going on, she declared a fast and she interceded with all of her handmaidens for this situation too, that God would give her wisdom. Now, it's interesting. I'm not going to go into all the, all the customs of the uh, Persian kings. You couldn't just walk into their presence. And Esther had not been called in to see the king for 30 days prior to this. And she knew that if she just walked into the king and told the king what was going on, that it could cost her her life. I mean, that's, that's the kind of that's the kind of environment that these pagan ancient kingdoms had. Uh, they really exalted the king almost to a place of, of a god. And so she knew she couldn't just walk into him and say, uh, hey, buddy, we got a problem here. You know, it's not like our wives, you know, when they want to talk. <laughs> you know, when they want to talk to us, they don't, have to, they don't have to wait for us to extend our scepter to them to, to come into our presence, right? Would you guys agree to that? That's right, yeah, that's right. So, I mean, they, they can nail us any time, 24 hours a day, even in the middle of the night, you know. <laughs> Has your wife ever had a dream about something and, and then you woke up and the next morning she was mad at you because of what she dreamed? <laughs> Think, what? I didn't do, you know. Yeah, like, what'd you do? Yeah, she dreamed something about you that you didn't do, that you never even thought of doing, and your wife wakes up mad. I'm thinking, I didn't do it. You dreamed that. Anyway, that's off the subject. But, you know, the, the, yeah, they, you know, middle of the night, any time of the, any time of the day or night, you know, our wives have, should have access to us. And, and that's good. But, but that was not the case in this story, believe me. And so Esther had to intercede for God's will to know how to approach the king. And so uh, Mordecai then, you know, he was also in a very unique position, the fact that he was a part of the royal court. Now, now another story we didn't talk about, another aspect of this story was Mordecai, several uh, weeks or months prior to this, 
actually uncovered a plot against the king's life and told Esther, and Esther told the king, uh, told her eunuch, and up the channels it went. And the king was basically delivered from most likely an assassination plot against him. Two of his inner court servants were upset with him and were planning on harming him. And so this whole thing is, is a part of the story too. Because one night the king, while Esther, and it's interesting, notice this. While Esther was fasting and interceding, waiting for, the God, for God's plan to come into the king's presence, the king had a night where he couldn't sleep. And since he couldn't sleep, he called uh, for his servant to bring him the chronicles of the kingdom, and he was reading. It's probably like the daily log, you know, where, where some, I know in the military we had that, where, where all the things that happen uh, during a certain period are logged down. And so he was in the middle of the night going back and reading this log, and he found out in the log that a man named Mordecai had basically uncovered this plot and saved the king's life. And so the next morning he gets up and he says, he's wondering, okay, what's been done? Has anything been done to reward Haman? I'm, I'm sorry, to reward Mordecai for what he did? Because, you know, the kings, even though they were extremely untouchable, they were also really into honor and rewards for people in their kingdom that did good things. And so it says here that he found out in Esther chapter 6 that uh, it was written that Mordecai reported concerning these two uh, servants, uh, two of the king's eunuchs uh, who were doorkeepers, that they had sought to lay hands on the king. And the king says, well, what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? Then the king's servants who attended him said, well, nothing has been done for him. So here comes Haman. Haman is the one who hates Mordecai that wants to kill him because the night before he had been so frustrated and angry about, about uh, how uh, Mordecai didn't bow down to him that his wife told him, go and, and build a gallows 75 feet tall and then hang Haman on it and then go see the king the next morning. So uh, I'm not Haman, ha Mordecai, hang Mordecai on it. So here's Haman coming into the king's presence after the king had found out that Mordecai had not been honored. Haman was coming in to get permission to hang Mordecai on his gallows. And the king is waiting for a servant to come in and tell them to go get Mordecai and honor him with the best of the kingdom. So the king, <laughs> isn't this cool? Because this is how God works. You know, here, here the devil is planning on some horrible thing and God is already at work to reverse it. So Haman comes into the king the next morning and immediately the king says to Haman, Haman, what should be done for somebody that the king wants to honor? Well, Haman's got such a big head, he thought he was talking about him. So Haman comes up with all this stuff. Put, put one of the robes on him that the king has actually worn. Wow. Take the king's horse, one of the king's horses that the king has actually ridden on. Now, those were fancy horses. And put the robe on him, put him on the horse, and have somebody lead him through the city declaring this is what happens to the one who the king wants to honor. So Haman's got this thing in his head. He's thinking, wow, I'm going to get to wear the king's robe. I'm going to get to ride on the king's horse. And some, uh, some servant's going to parade me through town and declare. He was just really into this thing. And then the king says, okay, Haman, go get Mordecai and do that for him. <laughs> Can you imagine? So, <laughs> so this is Mordecai's unique position. You know, it's, it's, he's on the verge of getting hung. An hour later, he's being paraded through the town by the man that was going to hang him, and he's wearing the king's robe and riding on the king's horse. So that's how God can work. Isn't that amazing? I mean, who would have ever thought of something like that? I couldn't come up with that kind of plan in my mind. But here God is behind the scenes. Why did the king not sleep that night? Because 
Esther was interceding and fasting with all of her handmaidens and God was at work. Isn't that amazing? God's already at work when we can't see it. So, Haman is totally humiliated. After he has this job of parading Mordecai through town and, and hollering out every so often, this is, this is, the, this is what happens <laughs> to the king. There was a lot of other riches involved in it too. He went back to his house. It said he hung his head and went back to his house. Now, here's the deal. It, it, this amazes me. This is how Satan's kingdom works. His wife, the night before, encouraged him to build the gallows to hang Mordecai. Not just his wife, but his key advisors and his wife. Now, he goes back after parading Mordecai through town, and he tells his wife what happened. And his wife turns on him and gives this prophecy. It says here in verse 13 of chapter 6, Haman recounted to Zeresh, his wife, and all of his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and Zareth, his wife, said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish origin, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. <laughs> now, now, this is the same woman that the night before told told. Her husband, go out there and build this big gallows and hang the guy. Now she's literally prophesying, buddy, you're in trouble. If this guy is of Jewish origin, you're, you're cooked. You're done. Because, I, I mean, I don't think she knew that naturally. I think it was a prophecy that God was bringing through her because God knew what was going to happen. And it's just an amazing aspect to the story here. And so uh, Haman just, he, man, he, he'd lost all of his cards. I mean, he was just, he was cooked. And so now, but he's still going to this banquet the next day with uh, Esther and uh, the king, because he doesn't know yet that Esther's a Jewess. And so that whole story unfolds, and we see that uh, Haman is brought into the king's presence. They had a two-stage banquet that Esther had requested that uh, the king and Haman were the only guests at. And this is, this is obviously a plan that the Holy Spirit had given Esther during her time of seeking the Lord and fasting, that that's how God wanted to set up this, this opportunity to... Uh, to reveal what was really going on. And so Esther, then the second phase of the banquet, the next day, she, she said, the king, the king asked, asked, him, asked her, uh, what is it that you want me to do for you? Because that was the whole idea that the king was wanting to uh, bless Esther, and Esther was having these banquets so that the king would grant her a request. And basically she said, that my people be saved. Because there is an evil person within the kingdom that has set out to kill and destroy all of my people. And the king was, he was just irate. He says, well, who in the world would do that? Because once again, he didn't know. He didn't know that his queen, whom he loved, was a Jew. And Esther said, it's this wicked Haman. Can you imagine being at that banquet? <laughs> and you're Haman? You're thinking, man... And that was another thing in, in Haman's puffed up mind and puffed up opinion of himself. He thought he was really something because he was going to a banquet with the queen and the only body there was the king and him. So he, he was going around bragging to all of his friends about that too. And so he goes in and, and he's sitting there and Esther reveals the fact that she is a Jew and that her people, there's a decree to kill her people and her and it's so cool, the humility that Esther speaks to the king in. She says to the king in chapter 7, she says, if, if it was just a decree, a decree to enslave the men and women of our, of our people, I wouldn't even bother you with that. We would just gladly become slaves, and I wouldn't even bother the king with that type of a request. But it's beyond just being enslaved. They actually want to kill us and destroy us. So it's amazing. So that whole story kind of wraps up with uh, the whole plan kind of backfiring on Haman. And he's taken out and hung on his own gallows that were built for Mordecai 
total turnaround. Isn't it amazing how God just uh, totally delivered a nation of people with one little girl and one older gentleman that were alert, willing to intercede, willing to fast, willing to seek God, willing to trust God for a, a plan. And, and so what can we learn from this story? Uh, there, I think there's a lot we can learn, and, and it's really, it, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's really helped me, because I've been really irritated the last several months with the political situation and, and what I knew was coming and what is now coming, because, uh, you know, we saw this coming before the election, and, uh, and, and it's caused me to think, okay, God, you haven't called me to uh, save the political fabric of our nation, even though I've always been interested in that and always liked to be active in that. You've called me to trust you, to know your will, to know your word, to listen to your voice, to be a leader for the church and my family and anybody else that will listen to me, to keep a balanced view of what we're doing in this life and what's coming in the coming kingdom. And so for me, what, what I see in this story of Esther is no matter how bad things look on earth and how bad things get, and no matter what kind of decrees or laws or, or weird ungodly things that the government or the king tried to do, specifically pointed at God's people. <laughs> we know this, that it's not going to catch God by surprise. In a crisis, God always has a plan. You know, there, there's one political party that, that brags about that their line is, we never let a good crisis go to waste. Have you heard that one? Yeah. Well, God says this, I never let a good crisis go by without me winning the victory. Amen. So there's going to be a victory. I mean, there may be some dark days. It may look like things are falling apart. It may look like sometimes it look like there's no hope. I'm sure, I'm sure there were times when Esther thought, oh my gosh, this is, this is too much for me. But God had a plan, and he used that little girl in a powerful way and used her, her cousin as well. So this is what we can learn from the book of Esther. Don't be alarmed when you see things that look like <clears throat> they are specifically focused for your destruction or your detriment. God has a plan and God has a way to work us through that. God's solutions are far more wise and more powerful than the enemy's schemes. Just look at the elements of that story that we went through today. How in the world how in the world and how powerful and how much wisdom is there beyond earthly wisdom for God to do what he did and to position those people and to turn that whole thing around? It's amazing. And so God's solutions are always wiser, always more powerful. The Scripture tells us, I believe it's in the book of 1 Corinthians, that the foolishness of God, Paul says, is wiser than the wisest man. Isn't that amazing? If God, now God isn't foolish, but if God could be foolish, which he's not, but it's a comparison, it's an overstatement. If God could be foolish and silly, he would be so far beyond the wisdom on earth. So it's not a problem for God to come up with a plan to bless his people, to deliver his people, and ultimately Jesus is coming back at the end of this age and a kingdom is going to be set up that's going to be more glorious than anything we've ever seen in the history of the world. In Daniel chapter 7, I see, I, I, I love this passage. I've read it several times, used it several times in teaching. But I would say that this is the ultimate deliverance that God is going to give us. I'm going to read to you Daniel chapter 7, verses 25 to 27 in closing. Talking about the Antichrist, like Haman, Haman is a type of the Antichrist, he will speak out against the, the Most High and wear down the saints of the Highest One. That's happening right now in our culture. The, the godly, ungodly ones are speaking out against all biblical principles, 
all ideas of biblical righteousness and morality, even on the floor of our, of our governmental bodies now, they're openly denying that God has any place there. One of the moderators of the floor of the House of Representatives this week, I think it was early this week, maybe it was last week, said that the will of God has no place in the chambers of the House of Representatives. Because another representative tried to quote a Bible verse in reference to the Equality Act and talked about how that wasn't God's will for the country to adopt that ungodly law. And the moderator spoke up and said, God's will has no place here. I'm going to tell you something, folks. That's, that's pretty brazen. You can, go on, you can go on YouTube and see it for yourself. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but it's on there and it's very clear. It says, he will speak out against the Most High. He will wear down the saints of the Highest One. He will intend to make alterations in times and in law. Right now, laws are being made that are unbelievably altering our culture. They will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Now, that's specifically talking about the last three and a half years of the tribulation. Times, time, and half times, three and a half years in biblical reckoning. And it's talking about when the Antichrist comes into full power. But the spirit of the Antichrist is doing a lot of this right now. But the Antichrist, when he actually comes, will even accelerate that. But notice verse 26. I love this. It starts out with but. You know, but is one of the most powerful words in Scripture. One of my favorite verses is Ephesians 2, chapter 1, verses 4. It says, but you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Talks about all of the things and all of the darkness that we lived in. But then in verse 4 it says, but God being rich in mercy with the grace that he poured out upon us. Talked about how he saved us even before we knew him. Before, while we were yet sinners, it says, Christ died for us. And, and I love that. Now look at verse 26. But the court <laughs> will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away. Now, that, that's, that's the court of heaven. That's not the supreme court on earth. Okay, that, That's a big court. That's the biggest court in the universe. It says the court will sit for judgment, and his, the Antichrist's dominion, will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty and dominion and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions will serve and obey him. Isn't that awesome? That is a promise. That no matter how bad, how dark, how difficult things get on this earth, God is going to set up a court in heaven at the right time. He will make a judgment. And the word promises us, not just in this place, but throughout Scripture, that the judgment will be in favor of the saints of God and that we will inherit the kingdom. Isn't that awesome? Amen. So we don't have to be fearful. I mean, we might go through some difficult times. I'm, I'm sure we will. But the good news is we win. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Help us to see the pattern in Esther that gives us tremendous encouragement to walk through the days, the world that we live in today, and uh, regardless of what our government tries to do to restrict, to hinder, to silence, to cancel, uh, to uh, do whatever they try to do, Lord, uh, your word will go forth and we will continue to speak and testify for the name of Jesus. So, Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your power. We thank you for salvation in the name of Jesus. We give you praise today. Let's stand together. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus personally, I mean, have an active, vibrant, uh, daily relationship with the Lord, I want to encourage you. Now's the time. I mean, times are still pretty good right now. We've still got quite a bit of freedom. 
Don't wait until we don't have freedom to gather and to gather together and pray for one another to try to seek the Lord. Now's the time to really strengthen your relationship with the Lord. Amen. Let's worship Him. I'm going to be up here if anybody wants prayer. If you want prayer for healing, if you want to talk to somebody about becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ, prayer for other issues, I'll be glad to pray with you. Let's worship Him. today and uh, just pray that uh, you go in peace and have a wonderful week. Bless you.